Thanks, Chris. And so I'd like to uh, introduce Walter, and Walter's going to introduce the topic and talk a little bit about it and uh, have his panel come on and begin the session. Walter. Once upon a time, I had an opportunity to go live in the south of France. My professor retired. My children weren't in school yet, and I said, let's do it. And pretty much my building on my retired professor's property looked like this. <laughs> he expected us to do a lot of work there. He had a vineyard and olive trees, and it was a fantastic year. Um, that's a breathing building. <laughs> And I do a lot of research on sustainability, and I've been, I started this topic. I am the one who put it on the, the list that people use at the last slam to pick the topics that they wanted to do. And this one got chosen, and I got chosen to be here introducing the people who are going to speak, all of whom are excellent and fantastic. Um, I was researching things like VOC paints, uh, no VOC paints. And I, I discovered, for example, that the list of things that are called VOCs in the United States is this long, and in Europe, it's this long. And so there's a lot to be done in terms of improving, because up until the Industrial Revolution, that was the basic shelter of the planet. You know, we used plaster and rock and wood and lime and cement and so on to build. And we didn't build things that were toxic to us like we have since the Industrial Revolution and specifically petroleum-based products. And so that, we are now trying to discover going from that to that, which is a magnificent airtight, wonderful building. And because of that, we have to put in systems that are going to keep us healthy. Um, so there's a lot to look at in terms of where we're going to go um, in our future. So that's what brought this topic to mind, and that's what I'm introducing. So the first person who's going to speak, um, Sean Oram from Ecotope. Um, I've worked with him on a couple of projects. Um, their whole company is, is brilliant and um, knows what's coming in the future in terms of how to answer our energy efficiency questions and our air, indoor air quality questions and so on. So I will let Sean introduce himself if he needs to say any more about himself and um, turn it over to Sean. Thank you. Hi, like Walter said, Sean Oram with Ecotope. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer. I've been there about 13, 14 years and uh, worked with some of you on several different projects. Um, so just a little background. Walter sort of asked me to present on breathable buildings. He says it was, it's sort of a three-part deal. So I figured I would kind of focus on the ventilation energy and also kind of talk about what, what we kind of see as coming in terms of standards and regulation. Okay, forward. <laughs> okay, you can be my forward. All right, so um, sort of real basic agenda. I think I have about 10, 15 minutes. Um, why do we ventilate? So, um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the source outdoor air status, so just in the world and regionally. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit on ventilation systems and then some energy impacts on the systems. The other speakers will, will sort of dive in on some other areas. Um, so how do we ventilate a building? Um, well, let's first talk about ventilation. So ventilation is really the process of processing or replacing air uh, in a space to provide higher indoor air quality. And we do this to control moisture, we do this to control pollutants, and we do this for odor control. That's really the, the high level on why we ventilate a building. Next. 
Um, so sources of poor IEQ, this is kind of the, the higher level, but we've got sources internal to the building, we've got sources outside of the building. Uh, other folks on this panel will talk a lot more about some of the sources indoor. I'm going to cover just quickly some stuff about some of the outdoor pollutants. Um, this, is, this, is, this was actually a protest in China. Some art students were protesting the, the air quality for probably good reason. Um, so the, the EPA and um, AQI have come up with an air quality index. Next. Uh, and, and this is sort of a, this is, this is used internationally and this is just a, a, like a check on what the air quality is. And this is really a measure of, of sort of the, the top pollutants outdoors, and it's, it's particulates, it's NOx, but mostly it's all related to fossil fuel burning outside. That's what most of this is about. Next. Um, and so this is, this is a snapshot one day of the world, the, and, and the, AQ, the, the IAQ the, um, index. And we can see you know, the Northwest over here, pretty nice. Europe, yeah, you know, the yellows, but this is kind of the problem area. There's also a big problem area here, which isn't noted much, and there's also some here, but this is kind of the bigger picture of what's going on, and, and for those of you who know ASHRAE, American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, has just sort of teamed with an IAQ piece, and so that's now gonna be part of building systems. HVAC systems will now have an IAQ component to it. Uh, the big fear now is, is what this, this pollutant level coming this way. And so it comes this way and across here. It's not there yet, but this is what ASHRAE is preparing for. And so there's a big concern now about particulate. So PM 10 and five, so 10 micron and, and 2.5 micron size. And others here will talk a little bit more about that, but it's essentially particulate matter from burning of fossil fuels, among other things. There's other p components of it too, but that's the majority. So transportation buildings. Um, so that's the big, big um, worry right now, and that's kind of what's going on. Um, next. This was a reading taken um, about two years ago, and so this is off the charts for Beijing. Um, you know, everything, PM 2.5, this is a very standard um, sort of IAQ measurement, and you can find this online, you can see it everywhere, but everything is off the charts here. PM 2.5, 10, you can see this red, that's 500, this is, you know, 400. Uh, PM 10, there's, you know, a bunch of other gaseous, you know, ozone, CO, um, NOx, sulfur dioxide, you know, temp and everything else, but but you know, that's, that's what they are living with. And depending on um, how the winds are, are doing, this, these are two days apart. This is Beijing on the 19th and that's the 22nd. Um, I've seen some, some buildings done in Beijing where they actually use operable windows, surprisingly. Um, there was a big study done um, by someone down at Cal Berkeley. He went and looked and, you know, how efficient are buildings in China? And they're actually very efficient. And they've learned to kind of work within this. It's pretty interesting. They, they basically look outside and they say, it's a natural ventilation day, open the windows. And if it's not, they close it up and do mechanical systems. And I think that's, you know, that's, a, that's a kind of a far out there extreme view, but that's, you know, that's one approach to sort of you know, deal, naturally ventilating and, and trying to create a breathable building. It's, it's sort of you know, looking at what's going on outside. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know what the air is like on this day, but I'm imagining it's a lot less. And I've looked at this Beijing chart before, and I've seen it all the way down as good as Seattle. So it's really kind of a function of winds there is what they were saying in this presentation. But, yeah, I mean, this is, these are, that 500 day, that's what it's like in Beijing. So that's sort of extreme. Um, this was uh, not last Friday, but a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can see we've got sites here. These tend to be the higher values, but still below 50 even. 50 is, you know, 50 and below are sort of good. Um, so that's, that's something to look at. You can see there are some days here that sort of correlate with high traffic times. But generally speaking, you know, we have really good air quality here. We have favorable winds. We don't, we're not, you know, locking people in. It's not LA. We don't have a sort of a trap 
Some days we do, but, but generally air is good. And the reason I, I mention this is because this is our filtration device for, for cleaning up our buildings. It's, it's getting this good air into our spaces. And when the air is like that, you know, we don't have to do much in the way of filtration um, because you know, this, is, this is a lot better air than anything inside of a house. So again, some of the outdoor pollutants, we kind of talked about that, but um, particulate, you know, this is, this is sort of um, the big concern right now in the U.S. and what ASHRAE is really, really starting to be concerned about. The rest are gas. These are really hard to deal with um, from mechanical systems. It's, you, know, you have to get into some really fancy processes to, to pull this stuff out of buildings. Uh, they make, you know, they make stuff. I mean, we're working on a casino right now for a tribe that allows smoking, and we've got a $25,000 smoke capture filtration thing with a, you know, 5,000 uh, every three months change out maintenance costs. But that's, I mean, that's the level it takes to deal with this stuff. It's, it's really expensive and it's difficult. And so, um, next. And then the, the indoor pollutants, which will be discussed further. Um, VOCs, this is, a, this is a big component. You know, like Walter said, it's a huge list. Um, you know, a lot of that is furnishings. A lot of it's what we build with. Um, formaldehyde's a big piece of that. There's a bunch of other ones. I not really, don't really want to get into all that. But um, indoor cooking is also a really big source of pollutants, both PM 2.5 and, and other, other things. Uh, and then CO2 from breathing. This has been sort of the reason all the codes have traditionally been written around is, is to replenish um, you know, CO2, to flush CO2, but, but we sort of use that to also flush everything else out. And that's sort of what, the, what they say is that we use CO2 as a guide because CO2 and VOC, sorry, VOCs sort of, sort of um, they ride together. So if CO2 levels are up, VOCs tend to be up. And that just means that your space needs more air filtration. Uh, radon and mold. So um, these are the EPA's recommendations for improving IAQ in a home. Uh, one is source control, so eliminate sources. Uh, this would be try not to burn stuff indoors, um, you know, furnishings and things that you bring in, um, try to minimize VOCs, that sort of stuff. Uh, ventilation, use clean outdoor air to ventilate and flush indoor pollutants. This is the kind of the primary objective of, of built, the built, built spaces that we live in. Uh, and then air cleaning. So this is kind of a, what, what um, you know, EPA is recommending that we, we use these air cleaning devices for in, in the, inside the house. We don't do a whole lot of that around here, but California does a lot of this. And um, you know, we're starting to see a lot more clients actually requesting this as kind of a, a marketable, saleable piece. But, but um, you know, this is kind of a new and up and coming thing. Um, so with the, with the particulate um, filtration, um, you know, there's a MERV level. And so you can go down from 1 all the way to 20. I don't expect you to read all this. But it just shows as you, as you tighten up the filtration levels, that's, how you, that's, how you, that's sort of one of the best ways to capture PM 2.5 and 10. And there's a lot of debate as to how high you have to go. Um, you know, HEPA starts at MERV 17, and they say, That'll capture a particle of the 0.3 micron, but there's also um, studies out there that have said MERV 13 is adequate because once you start to load the filter up, uh, you'll you'll actually capture some of that. But you're really capturing 2.5 with adhesion. It's not just a, a filtration in a hole size. You're actually trying to get it to to grab on the surfaces. Uh, there's also electronic air cleaners. So these these strip electrons away from from dirty air and then they, they attach to these surfaces. Um, you know, finding the ones that don't generate ozone is, is kind of the trick. And so they're actually illegal if they generate a certain amount of ozone in California. So it's just something to keep an eye on. Uh, and then you can get into UVGI and PCO, but these are, these are sort of chemical processes to deal with sort of really bad air. This is a, an example of a process we're using for a smoking environment, unfortunately. Um, and then this is an, exa an example of an indoor air cleaner. So you can see there's pre-filter, medium, HEPA, activated carbon, and some customized stuff. But this is a lot of what's being sold. I don't know anything about that. I don't sell those. I <laughs> haven't really done much with them. But um, that's what the EPA is recommending. So 
in terms of clean. Okay, now into the ventilation systems. Um, you know, there's really four ways that we ventilate a space. So in, in, in an effort to kind of create this quote unquote breathable building, um, you know, we can do an exhaust only system where we bring in um, fans with trickle vents for makeup air. We can do a balance flow ERV system. Those are both mechanical ventilation systems. We've got operable windows, and then we've got just general building leakage. So those are, those are the primary ways that a house is ventilated. You're, you're exchanging the air with fresh outside air. Uh, and then we'll talk about ventilation and energy. This is a, a funny um, comic. Um, so this is the actual um, energy use in the Northwest. This was taken from the RBSA uh, sample, and that's a regional baseline sample. It was done three years ago. And that's, that's the end use from 100 units, both new and old. Uh, this is the national average. Uh, so right now, the site EUI is 38. It's been 38 for 30 years. Um, and the only thing that's happened in the region um, is the house size has got bigger, and this number used to be that big. You know, the pie was the same, you know, magnitude, the same 38, but we've just traded this for bigger house side and more things to plug in. These also actually do some of the heating. So what we're talking about with the current energy codes are numbers like this for, in terms of energy use. So we, we're talking about ventilation systems and, and possibly trying to reduce energy. Um, with the new codes, the way that it works out, so getting a home to ACH5, uh, at 50 pascal, um, the, the ventilation and the infiltration component is about that much. It's about 20 to 25 percent. So it's a much smaller number, number than what we had. So it makes it difficult to justify really fancy things if you're trying to do this on a cost basis. So that's, you know, that's not the only agenda, but that's, that's a lot of the sort of the mechanics in the region, how they work. It's, it's all based on our cheap cost of energy. I, I'm not saying that's the right way, I'm just saying that's what it is. Uh, so, um, but that's, that's the outside air piece that we have to heat now with our new construction stuff. Um, one important um, sort of component of, of trying to deliver energy efficient homes are to, under, to, to sort of gain an understanding of what a balance point is. Balance point of a building means it's the outside temp where a building first needs heat. Um, what these are are what we call bin hours. These are the number of hours per year. There's 8760 hours in one year. And so if you were to divide them up by their temperature bins, for instance, 35 to 40 would encompass about 1,100 hours a year. And, and this is kind of, this is the breakout based, based on, you know, I guess historical bin data. But this shows where most of the temperature bins are. In a typical code home, we, we have a balance point of about 55. So that says 60% of, the, of all the hours in the year, we have to turn on the heating system. And with that comes the ventilation system. If you, well, just, yeah, that's, that's the balance point. Um, so that's, that would be kind of an exhaust-based system. It's hard to move that balance point down with an exhaust-based system. Because as soon as you start, if, as soon as you bring in untempered outside air, it's got to be heated. And so your gains in your space sort of heat some of, those, some of that air, but as soon as it, you know, it gets down to a certain level and you've got to turn the heat on to make it up to maintain 70 degree. That's the balance point of a typical exhaust-based system. Is that nationally or is Seattle? The, uh, that's, yeah, those are um, Seattle bin hours. And so that's just climate data for Seattle. That's all that is. Um, and then if we use an ERV and do a really good job with air tightness, we can drive down the balance point to here. So, Programs like Passive House, um, this, is a, this is a very key feature of it. And, it's a, you know, and this, is, this is definitely kind of the direction that, that the region needs to go is, is, to, is to really focus on pushing this down. It just happens that to get from here to here, you have to do a lot. And you, know, you guys are all familiar with all that. So, um, and then lastly, so I, I, I built a 2,200 square foot model of an RBSA base case. So I, I tuned it all to here. And this was the heating energy that resulted. So this is all the heating energy for the building. Uh, 2,200 square foot house with the UA, you know, the current UA, current energy code. 
Uh, and so this is just looking at the ventilation systems alone and its impact to energy use. And so this first column kind of shows about 6,300 kilowatt hours. This is all heat you have, to, you have to do for this house, and this is the ventilation fan. And so if we take, this is an ACH5, which is current code. If we go ahead and, uh, and make the, the building a lot tighter, say ACH2, we see a, a, a drop of about eight or 900 kilowatt hours a year. So that's, that's actually a very popular measure that happens. And then we can introduce ERVs into the picture. Um, and what you're trading off is um, fan energy. So you've got more fan energy and then you've got um, you know, reductions in the actual space, space heating. Um, and so you can do this with different classes of ERVs and these are, these are sort of better and better ERVs. Um, and then you get to like a pH, a passive house level ERV and you get to here. What this is saying is that this is the base case and this is super tight and, and passive house. That's telling us that our theoretical limit for this ventilation rate is about there. So that's all related to ventilation. The rest is envelope. So couple, two options really on the table, you could take an exhaust based system and apply a heat pump to it and you end up with this level. And then further, sort of the, the optimum premium would be the passive house approach. And you can see that you know, the, the envelope and, and the ventilation systems will get you all the way down to here. And so this is what's left in, the, in sort of the codes in our region. And that's, you know, that's what we're all sort of shooting for. So getting down there, you know, that's about the theoretical limit. But that's, you know, that's going from 6,800 down to about, you know, 1,000. And so that's it. And that's the end. So questions? Oh, sorry, ductless heat pump. And so a ductless heat pump says, um, if you just tighten the building up and put a ductless heat pump in, you only have to buy one third of the energy. So using a heat pump in the Northwest, the most efficient use of hydropower's electricity is to use a heat pump in, in your home. And so you're only using one third of that energy. And so I guess go back yeah. real quick, sorry. Um, so, um, you know, right now we can, we can take this house and put a heat pump on it and we end up here. We can take this house and make it a passive house and that's where we end up. And so, um, you know, there's cost effectiveness questions about this, but, you know, generally speaking on the long term, you know, this is where we, the region needs to be. Um, so ventilation systems optimized for energy use. Um, you know, the, the, the theory that, that we like is to sort of set the building up so that you can run it in active mode. So when you need heating, you run a ventilation system and you run it in passive mode when it's nice out. And so you set it up so you can, you, can, you know, it's secure and you can open the windows and let it ventilate. Um, you know, that's, we can do that for about four, maybe five months of the year and just run this as a passive system, you know, and there's nothing more efficient than off. And so that, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, if you can set up a building like that, you know, you only have to pay for this part and the rest is, is off. And then it, this is another key piece is don't overventilate. Um, you know, the current codes right now are built on a certain ventilation rate and they're banking on some, some leakage from outside air. You know, the, all, most buildings are leaky at some level. And, you know, as we start to drive the air tightness up, the ventilation rates are going to go up. And then we're going to have this filtration um, issue come in that ASHRAE is concerned about. And so then you start to question, like, well, what should we be doing? So we don't have the standard yet on what, what ASHRAE recommends, but it sounds like it's leading to, um, you know, mechanical heat recovery ventilation systems with, you know, some level of filtration and also some filtration, sort of recirculating filtration. So. Um, that's, that's sort of what's happening now, but the new version of ASHRAE 62 is going to have quite a bit of change in it along those lines, is what I'm hearing. So, any questions? It's not a question or a comment, but yeah. about active versus passive, it doesn't even need to be very complex. I just finished doing, you know, heat pump, the power works, ERV, all that stuff, and my programming is human programming. I wrote a note to my wife and said, <laughs> If uh, outdoor temperature is plus or minus three degrees from indoor temperature, open three windows, turn off the ERV. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's great. And if not, leave windows sh shut, leave the ERV on. And wow, 
We're at 72 degrees year round for less than 30 bucks a month, all in our house stall electric. So it, it works, and, and we had a very simple approach to it. So Great, yeah, fun. yeah, no, it's, we've done that with big commercial buildings too, and it works cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. If, if there are no more questions, I will, I will pass it on. Thank you, Sean. You're welcome. So I had three discoveries. Um, the first took place when I heard of the Gaia principle. Um, we all know it so well, but when I was much younger than I am now, um, it was unique. The earth is alive. Pretty cool. And then the next thing was um, I had kind of known about it for myself in terms of meditation, that I sit in the middle of an atmosphere and it's my atmosphere. And I went to a first grade class and I saw a teacher take a child who was having a bad day. And the teacher asked the child to sit down and to get inside his own atmosphere. I said, that's incredible. You know, we live inside an atmosphere that gives us this great ability to regenerate. Um, I had a friend who used to drive back to visit his parents and he wouldn't leave till 10 o'clock at night. And his idea when he got really tired was he would close his eyes and count to 10. And the adrenaline would keep him going for another hour or two. <laughs> and I discovered that when I got drowsy, all I needed to do was open a window, and that air was just incredible. I was just, it was like better than coffee. And then in, in looking at this topic, I realized that if we looked at buildings as living and looked at a building as to what it needs to behave and act and exist and have health best, those who are in it those who come to visit it will have that same positive quality. So that's why, that's one of the reasons why this breathing building topic came up. Um, I am meeting Eileen now for the first time. And I will let her introduce herself and to me as well as the rest of you. Some of you know her well. Eileen Gagney. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm just going to give you some background here. So um, I've been working in buildings for 40 years. I'm an architect by trade, a former general contractor and home inspector. And I've been working with the Lung Association for about 15 years. Um, I have multiple chemical sensitivities, and I also have asthma. So I bring to this, I merge building, science, and health, right? So. Um, I was made very, very sick by an overexposure to polyurethane about 20 years ago. And I was installing polyurethane in a small room in Vermont in the middle of the winter. Windows are open, heat was on, and I slept for 16 hours and didn't hear a chainsaw in my front yard. Ever since then, I can't be around any kind of chemicals. So perfumes, colognes, carpet, paint, all of that. My throat closes, I start talking like this, and I get a migraine. So, I started as a volunteer for the Master Home Environmentals Program about 18 years ago and fell in love with the program and I ended up being the director of the program and have been for 15 years. And um, my thoughts on this is that yes, buildings do need to breathe, we need to breathe. Our lungs, if you were to open them up and flatten them out, they're the size of a tennis court. They're the only organ we have that ex gets exposed outside to chemicals that we breathe every day instantly. They are incredibly valuable and we don't think about them. You don't think about them until you can't breathe, right? So, 
Thank you everybody for being here. Um, what I'm going to do is, is base this presentation not only on the health aspects, but also I just got back from Southeast Alaska. There is a huge um, HUD NOFA, which is a notice of funding availability for tribal communities for mold remediation and assessment and, and repair. And four villages in Alaska pooled their resources and flew me up so that I could assess their homes for the amount of mold. Now, mold is just one issue that I deal with in homes, but we have it everywhere here. It's a huge issue. Um, so the pictures you're gonna see are my tales and my stories. Um, but the first thing I'm gonna do is actually talk about, if I can, come on, work with me here. Thank you. Okay, he's gonna do it, okay. So, why breathable buildings? We spend 90% of our time indoors, right? And most, and, and that indoor air can be five times as polluted as outdoor air. Now, the re, when I was growing up, I was outdoors. I was playing, I was beating up boys, I was building tree houses, okay? Now they're not, they're playing their Wii's, they're playing on their computer, right? These things, have not been such a great tool for us. They have been in some ways, but they have not helped us in other ways, right? So in the EPA team study showed air pollutants regulated in ambient air are in greater concentration indoors 100 to 1,000 times more than outdoors, right? New materials, less ventilation, buildings tightened, combustion, radon, biological contaminants. Next one. And the effects of them can range from those that are transient and only affect productivity, okay, so CO2, things like that, to those that are long-term, <coughs> produce chronic or severe effects or even disability and death. Who knows what indoor air pollution can cause death? Yes, sir, what do you got? What, what can cause death from indoor air pollution? Your lungs shut down. Okay, so what do you get exposed to that do that? Well, the is, uh, asthma, perfumes, chemicals. Anybody else? Yes, Doug. Radon. Radon. Second leading cause of lung cancer. Totally preventable. Everybody here should have their home tested for radon. I don't care if where you live. Everybody should, right? Second leading cause of lung cancer. All right. Um, next one. So. I'm gonna talk about, whoops, whoa, okay. So the, the particles that I am most concerned about for you all and for everybody, especially children, <coughs> elders, pregnant women, anybody with a compromised immune system, I am most concerned about these respirable particles. These are the ones that are so small, they are less than 10 microns. So they behave like a gas, and you've all seen these things floating in the air, these dust particles, right? They're behaving like a gas. The problem is they go past all of our natural defenses. They go past our nose hairs and our cilia in our lungs. They go way down deep into our lungs and they can cross, they're so small, they can cross directly through the cellular membrane into the bloodstream where they can affect other organs besides your lungs, okay? And if you take one particle and you cut it in half, you take one, cut in half, you've got more surface area. You cut that in half, you've got more surface area, more surface area, more surface area, where they can actually absorb more contaminants like sulfur dioxide and PAHs, which are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are known carcinogens. Next one. So, I was in Alaska. This is in Ketchikan. And this was buyer's remorse, a young man, tribal native, had gotten enough money and he bought this home. The community's up there. So what you're seeing is a major amount of efflorescence, not only the, on the foundation wall, but also coming up through the floor. This looks like any home in Ballard, right? <laughs> My home used to look like this, not anymore, okay? So the problem is we don't have the education. These buildings are not being maintained, designed, site, sited, designed, maintained, and kept up to ways in which they are able to breathe. Just like we do, we need to breathe, they need to breathe, right? So what's causing the efflorescence? What does that? 
water and salt. So the water comes, hits, the, hits the walls, and as it evaporates, it leaves the salts behind, right? Next picture. So this next one, this is a really, this is a really fun one. So on the top <laughs> left, there is significant mold, right? On the bottom, that's where he used spray foam to hold the drywall together. Now, in Ketchikan and in Southeast Alaska, the, it rains horizontally. And on the outside of this structure, the siding had cooked. There was no caulking left. There was nothing left. So you've got some severe deferred maintenance. He's got, in some ways, great indoor air quality because that building is really breathing. <laughs> but he's having some other significant issues. He was getting really, really sick. All right, next one. So in these next ones, you'll see the one at the top. What happened here was, and, and I find this, ha I find this, uh, it can happen quite a bit in Seattle, weatherization gone wrong. They blew in insulation into all the eaves, so now the attics couldn't breathe. So now you've got all this moisture coming down, getting stuck in there, and Southeast Alaska, remember, it's really moist. It's a very wet environment. And it was, and people don't get this. They don't see this stuff. They're just like, oh, look, there's a leak. Well, it was leaking so badly, and actually, I have a picture of where it leaked on the woman's uh, lampshade where she sat, and it went behind her head. And this is what they found when they moved it. Same thing here. You've got all this leaking. So. Once again, next one, let's go to the next one. These two homes, these are homes that were <laughs> both being the top, your left. Um, they used, it was a, a, fam a traditional home and it was a family home. They'd been in their family for years, but they didn't want, they couldn't afford the money to keep it up. The roofing had all gone. This was, this was left. <laughs> The, the, this mold resulted from a roof leak, the second floor up, all the way through and down into the kitchen. Not to mention the clutter and everything else. So the house couldn't breathe. It couldn't, actually, I, I was surprised it wasn't, as, it, was, it wasn't worse than what this is. This next one here on the right, the man who lived there was an elder, and he couldn't live in there because it was making him so sick. He wanted to go back, but couldn't afford to fix the house. Next one. So, question to the audience. What's going on in the upper right? Why the black spots? What's, what's that? Why on those, why in that particular pattern? Nails from what? How about a chimney, where a chimney used to go through? Right, so, and then how about this bottom one here? That's in the kitchen. Why is it co collecting over the cabinetry? So they're trying to let this house breathe, but obviously they got some problems. <laughs> they got some congestion, <laughs> right? So yeah, so you'll see this time and time again. We see this over and over again. Next one. Okay, what do you think? <laughs> so, so the one upper on the right, once again, weatherization gone bad. This is a new fan installed by a weatherization crew. How come it's, how, why do you think it's doing, the, the, it's creating the patterns it's doing? It screwed the damper shut. Screwed the damper shut. <laughs> That's good, yes. I've done that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there you go. And how about this one? How about on the left? Missing insulation. Missing insulation. So it's cold there, so it's collect, it's condensing there, right? So once again, you get these guys in there, you're not training them right, you're, you're saying, we're gonna do this great work, we're gonna air seal, we're gonna insulate, we're gonna make these, these homes better. In every home in Cake, Alaska, that, I, that, the insul that the weatherization crew came in, they made the situation worse. Everyone. Gotta be careful with this, right? Now, in Cake, which is where these two came from, the in most interesting house I ran into was this. Go in there, they had some mold, but their biggest issue is they had a bear living in their crawl space. Okay, and I'm like, well, now that's a first, <laughs> okay? 
And they go, well, yeah. And he comes back every fall. He rips the, the sheet metal off and goes back underneath it. Now, if you know anything about bears, they hibernate and they plug themselves up for the winter so they don't pee or poop. And so he, he goes in there to live and he hibernates and then he moves out in the spring. Nice. <laughs> okay, next one. So then we have the crawl spaces. So, so these crawl spaces, so in most of the villages, that the, the four villages that I went into, they either have uh, rock or they have glacial till, which is harder than rock, believe it or not. And these houses were either, either on stilts or posts. They were reusing the creosote-soaked posts that they used in the sea as the posts underneath these homes, right? They wonder why they have such high cancer rates and asthma rates and all these things. We have to be very careful what we're doing. <laughs> and you went into these crossways and all you could smell was the creosote. And then you saw standing water and they have pallets on there so they could walk across the, the dirt. There's no, there's no vapor barrier, there's no nothing, right? So my point is this. We really have to be very careful how we implement these practices to make homes safer, more energy efficient, healthier, but they have got to breathe and they've got to breathe clean, good air, just like we do, right? Yes, Doug. And air sealing. It, so this one, they actually, they, they attempted to air seal and insulate underneath the floor of the first floor, right? Well, they didn't get it quite right because they captured the moisture inside there. So actually the insulation and everything started to get moldy and the guy inside was getting sick. Almost every home I went into, all the residents said that they felt better when they left their homes, right? And they did. I mean, I walked into some of these homes and it was like, whoa, okay. You know, but then I just saw some pictures from the Tulalip tribes and some of their housing. Some of their housing up there, they have these contractors come in, they build these housings, they go wham, bam, and then they leave, never to be found again. They are putting buildings without proper site drainage and site grading on land that then the crawl space becomes a holding pond. And I've seen pictures where there was two feet of standing water in June in that crawl space. And we haven't had rain, right? Well, they dig down, and it's a very high water table. They didn't do the, the proper drainage, and all of a sudden, you've got a perfect place for a pool. Then I was joking with Gillian Middlestat, saying, hey, they could put some salmon in there and have a fish farm, you know? <laughs> you know? Anyway, I don't mean to joke, but it's all about really being able to let the building breathe properly. And not only with what you do on the outside, because outside affects inside, right? My biggest issue with, the biggest issue I have with client, the clients that I go, the homes I go into are household products. Over mold. This is just some of this. People love their chemicals. Oh, it reminds, it doesn't smell clean unless it smells like pine salt or Mr. Clean. Oh, and then there's the disinfecting wipes, right? So that's a whole nother, but it's, it's a partnership. As you said, it's a partnership, you, you, the, what'd you say, human, <laughs> human programming. We have to reprogram not only when you go in and you build these buildings and design these, you also have to educate and you have to tell folks because you can build the greenest, most sustainable building you want unless the folks know how to use it properly and how to maintain it, you're going to end up with any number of things. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Education. It's always about education. So on the table over here, you're going to see two brochures. I brought green cleaning recipes, and I also brought a brochure about our program. We provide free healthy home assessments to anyone who lives in Seattle. I will triage with anybody over the phone from all over the country. That's why they're after the, no, the mold, the HUD NOFA. <laughs> 
And, and part of it was talking to them when I was going through with the, with the housing staff is educating them about, okay, if you don't get this funding, what can you do, right? Well, you can do, there are some things they can do. The bear is an issue. I can't deal with that one, okay? He's a little bit too big and he'll just rip that siding right off and go underneath there. But there are things they can do. Give them green cleaning recipes. Baking soda and vinegar goes a long way. That's all you need to clean your home. It reduces the VOC content, which reduces your potential health effects, potential cancer. Formaldehyde is a known carcinogen. It's almost in everything we have. So if we can get that out of homes, and not only what they bring in, but what we build with, oh my God, we're, we're right there. Okay, thank you, good question. Yes, sir. I could show you worse housing here, easily, easily. I went into a home, was called back to a home by a client who had used me a couple years before. She didn't realize the mold extent of her daughter's bedroom till her daughter took off. She pulled back the bed, the back was covered with mold, it was a brick building, the, uh, the metal lintel, it was the, the water was leaking behind it, it was hitting the windowsill, dropping down, it hit the baseboard going psst, psst, psst. I'm like, okay, I think we got an issue. There was fungus growing out of the carpet. I have so many issues. I, I have so many, it, it's not a problem, trust me. We have lots of issues here with mold. Yes, ma'am. If you can smell it, it's actively growing. All right, that's the key. If you can smell it. Now, in the city of Seattle code, will not do work anything on mold. It, it, the, the law is this, if you have mold, it's the tenant's responsibility to clean it. If there is an active water leak, that's the responsibility of the landlord. However, all the landlord has to do is show that he started the work. Doesn't have to complete it, just start it. Yeah, I know there's so much things that's wrong with this. Yes, sir. E. coli. Well, I know, and then also, you know, the classic broken washer hose. Well, think about it. New York City has the only real uh, mold remediation uh, statistics on the books. Anything over 10 square feet has got to be professionally remediated. 10 square feet is not much. That's not much. If you are living in a moldy home, eventually you will be made sick. I guarantee it. I've been seeing anecdotally, and, and you know, the Institute of Medicine just came out that and mold exposure will cause an asthma episode for somebody who has asthma. It, I have seen chronic fatigue, rashes. I've seen fungus growing on a kid's head. I've seen any number of things. It will make you sick. Eventually, it will make you sick. You wanna clean it up, you wanna use PPE, you wanna protect yourself as much as you can with it. It's nasty stuff. And I don't, we don't recommend testing because what species are you gonna test for? There's thousands of species. There's, there's big bad boys, you know, there's Penicillium, Aspergillus, you know, whatever, Stachybotrys. I don't need to know what it is. I need to know you need to get rid of it and deal with the moisture issue. Moisture issue is number one. Yes, sir. Yes, John. Right. Yep. 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 You bet. <laughs> Nosing around. <laughs> PPE is personal protection equipment. So goggles, mask. I use full rest. If I'm going into crawl spaces because of my sensitivities, I use a, a, a dual uh, cartridge respirator. Zoot suits, gloves, the whole nine yards. You want to protect yourself. I mean, and if you talk to anybody who does mold remediation, they're always in full PPE. They have to be because they're around so much of it. Yes, sir. Yo, wait, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So, how are you doing? Um, I'm wondering, so Can't sell, tell you about the ammonium sulfate. That's another thing. Cellulose, um, it's, I've been doing a lot of studies on that because I have a, a finished attic. So I don't have, I only have a two by, it's a 1916 house. And 
if it's over, from what I understand, it's over 10 feet length. You're not supposed to use cellulose, but the foams haven't come back in with good ratings yet, so I'm probably going to blow in cellulose. Don't know the other one. Can't help you with that one. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now you can go. <laughs> Sorry. So I took a lot of new construction, and we're doing all, almost all the manufacturers like the Indiana, the cabins are big, the R2 standards now. Do you feel like those are enough? I just want to wonder how you feel about R2. Uh, and how much you tie it As much fresh air as you can bring in, the better. Because I, I really, you know, even though they're, they say low or no VOCs, they're still off-gassing. I, I actually had to leave an Alaska Airlines plane. It was too new. I went in and started reacting. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, so it depends on the products. But we've also done, when we did the build, Healthy Homes build, Training for Building Professionals, we went into one new home as a site visit. A contractor came in who didn't follow the specs. And I don't know what glue he used, but it made me so sick. I had to stand outside while everybody was in there. You were there? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. So gas flames and uh, cooking cups this time are very popular. Mm -hmm. Bad idea. Bad idea. Bad idea. Anything you burn creates polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are a known carcinogen. And you've got carbon monoxide, and unfortunately, our carbon monoxide detectors go there. There's all these different ratings for them, and the most sensitive ones go off when there is just the slightest. When the time, like your average one that we buy at Home Depot goes off, you're already at high levels. So that's when you said we had cooking is bad. It was about gas or you just I didn't say you I didn't say cooking was bad. That was the previous one. Yeah, it's 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 a source of all sorts of contaminants. So you've got particles, you've got gases, you've got all these things. And a lot of times if people in older homes where they have the choice of turning the fan on or not, and if it's noisy, they're not going to turn it on, you can get elevated carbon monoxide levels, SO2 levels, noxious levels, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. With an electric, it's different. Electric, it's different. You're not burning. It's not a combustion fuel. All right. If you burn something, you're still producing PAHs. So LBL has done some studies, and there are some problems even with electric cooktops. Sure. Because dust lands on it, sure. every time you turn the dang thing on, right. you burn it. And not all of us are world-class chefs. <laughs> you know, it's exactly the right temperature. So right. we burn stuff all the time right. anyway. So they're doing a lot of research on capture hoods. It's right. the size and the shape that matters more than the CFM and its distance above the cooktop. Right. That makes and sense. And induction ranges are really a good idea if you feel like spending the extra money for the nice cost. Right. Right, right. You can change some of your pots, but it's a whole other conversation. There was another one. Yes, yes, Laura. Hi. Hi. The air cleaners. I remember when I went through the environment for rent. Right. Anything that produces ozone, not good. Okay. So a lot of the, as, as our other presenter was saying, some of these electronic ones produce ozone when they first start up. Not a good thing. I've had uh, clients who are severely asthmatic who's had to change those out for the four-inch pleated paper ones, um, which works great. HEPA is great. You know, Dan Morris said don't even bother with the UV because it's in order for that to work, it's got to go over it for a slow, so slowly that as soon as you turn it on, it, it's worthless. So really, it's your HEPA. They've got all sorts of bells and whistles. I don't know enough about them. I'm not a scientist. So. You know, anything you can do to purify the air if you need to is great. Anything else? Yes, sir. What's it about fine particulate that makes it hazardous? Is it the chemical properties or the physical? It's the physical. It's, and, and, and actually, because of the physical, it then becomes part of the chemical. The chemical becomes part of it. They're so small, they bypass your nose hairs. And your lungs have, are full of all the cilia, this fine hair, just like a, a wheat field, right? And, and you know a smoker, they're always trying to hack all that crap out, right? Sorry. But <laughs> so it, it bypasses all of that, and it's so small, it goes way, way down deep into the lungs where it actually crosses the cellular membrane into the bloodstream. And because that surface area is so small, it can actually absorb a lot of other toxins like PAHs and all these other things that we are in dust, including DDT. They're still finding DDT in house dust. 
So yeah, burning dust is never a good idea. But yeah, so it's, it's and then it can travel to other organs. So then I have a question specific to my product. Portable vacuum cleaners, I tell people a lot of times those are bad. Is that accurate? There, it depends on the vacuum. What you sell is the best. It's harder to put in in, re in existing construction. But after that, then I say I hate bagless vacuums because when you have a bag, you go to dump it, you're two feet from all that, right? So I say, so I so don't want to want to want to buy a bag, and I'm like, okay. So you take the canister, put it outside, you put a bag on top, turn it over, look, you got a bag, right? You might as well be filtering it. So yeah, yours is the best. New construction's perfect. It's a little bit more difficult for existing. So HEPA filters, help HEPA vacuums, really good, well-sealed vacuums, and everybody's got, I know this is beyond what we're doing here, but uh, <laughs> you got to get your vacuum serviced every year. It's an amazingly important piece of equipment for your home, just like your car. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Eddie. You're welcome. Eileen's talk reminded me of, of uh, how much stress we all live with all the time, health-wise, and, and uh, where do we go to relieve that? Is we go outside and breathe fresh air, we go to the mountains, breathe fresh air, we go to the ocean, breathe fresh air. <coughs> Our next speaker, Dan Wildenhouse, um, we probably all know him very well. I've heard him speak many times. I'm very impressed with his knowledge and his, and his dedication and energy um, for the cause. And I thank him for coming this evening, and I'll let him take it from here. Thank you, Dan. Thanks. Um, so th as uh, Doug said, this really could be an adventure, because I basically wrote this this morning. Um, <laughs> So I, have, I don't really remember what's in here. I also have a lot of little animations so I could keep my total slide number. So this ought to be really interesting, doing stuff forward. Um, I'm also a nightmare for trying to do these filming things because anybody who's seen me before knows I like to walk around. It's how I get my steps, right, when I'm presenting. So I'm going to try my hardest to stay in the field of vision for people that are, are watching from out here. Um, I also don't generally like a microphone because I'm plenty loud. But since we're broadcasting, I'm going to try and use it, and we'll see if this works. Okay, so what am I going to talk about? That's a great question. So when this was first proposed to me, I heard I would be speaking with Eileen and Sean, and I thought, oh, that's great. And, and Walter said, you know, could you talk about breathing assemblies? And, of course, I'll agree to any chance to talk. So I said, sure, without really thinking about what that meant. And then thought, you know, I didn't just write it this morning. I've been thinking about this for a month. And then this morning it all came to me that I don't have a lot to say about assemblies. I have a little bit to say. So I'm going to start. Let's go to the next slide. And this is what I'm hoping I'm going to talk about. Um, in the first one, I'm going to start by preaching a little bit to the choir. Almost everybody here who knows me will, this is going to sound familiar. And then I'm going to go to a place that I think could only possibly be considered challenging with this particular audience um, at the first one. Then we're going to talk about something in particular with assemblies because I'm really glad some of the stuff that Eileen sh just showed us in pictures, some of the stuff Sean mentioned earlier. I think that's going to help tie in some things with assemblies. And then I want to talk at the end about something a little bit different, and that's the concept of what it means to have a breath of fresh air. Um, because is it always physical? Or is there another component sometimes? And I'm not usually the guy who goes there, but I'm going to try and go there a little bit. So next slide. Um, how about let's go the other way. There we go. So why should we add extra breathing capabilities to homes? Um, many of you have probably seen these slides before. This is the concept between Mother Nature being in control of your ventilation, meaning letting a leaky house do its job, versus the homeowner being in control of the ventilation. The first one here, we're talking about the concept of, in a very general sense, temperature-driven ventilation in homes. We'll get into it in just a minute what I mean specifically about that. But the, temp the difference in temperature between inside and outside is one of the major driving forces for leaky homes. 
we look at this and we look at the average indoor versus outdoor temperatures, basically if we let mother nature drive the ventilation in our house, it's like a broken clock. It'll be right about twice a year, it'll be dead on, meaning the green graph that's doing this versus the blue straight line, the blue straight line is how much ventilation we should have. What we're actually seeing is due to temperature difference, during the hot months of the year we're dramatically underventilated, and the cold months of the year we're dramatically overventilated. This is what happens when we let Mother Nature be in charge. More specifically, if we look at the other slide, this is actually showing at any given point in time for a tightness of house. Go back. Oh, yeah, back. So, <laughs> Oop, that's the same, it's the one with the two graphs. There we go. Um, on this one, if we look at this far side, this is showing at any particular point in time when we have a different tightness in a house and an outdoor temperature, and then a, uh, a ventilation rate that we've decided is approximately correct for the house, whether or not this house will be capable of ventilating itself naturally. If we look at that blue line there, the blue line on the top, that's a really, really leaky house. What that shows us is, as long as it's below 60 degrees, that really leaky house will ventilate at least as much as it should, or a lot more. Is it ever warmer than 60 degrees in Seattle? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I do, when I do this presentation in January, everybody's like, no, it's always 40 degrees. But, you know, we know, we know that's not true. We know sometimes, so even a really, really leaky house for a good portion of the year is going to be underventilated. How about a moderately tight house? This is the purple middle line diving down. In this case, as long as it's uh, warmer than 38 degrees, the house will underventilate. Is it ever above 38 degrees in Seattle? Almost all the year, it's above 38 degrees. So even a moderately tight house, if we would just let Mother Nature be in charge, it would need additional ventilation all the time. How about a tight house? That's this green line at the bottom. By the way, that's not passive house tight, that's just tighter than code house. No matter what the temperature is outside, that house is underventilated, right? So letting Mother Nature be in charge it's highly dependent on both the tightness of the house and the temperature between inside and outside. So again, the big picture, the more the macro and the micro. Okay, this should get interesting because this is where we start having animations. The first top driver of ventilation in homes is wind on the house. It's what will create the single strongest pressure difference between inside and outside. Um, I'm going to take a pause for a minute and ask a weird sounding question. How many people here have watched too many episodes of Law and Order on TV, right? So when you've watched Law and Order, what does it take to prove murder? To prove murder on Law and Order. It takes motive and it takes opportunity, right? It's the same thing with air leakage. It takes motive and it takes opportunity. Motive are the forces at work on the house and opportunities are the holes. As it turns out, wind on a house, especially a tall house, is the biggest motive we can have, because that's a big old, sometimes 25, 30 foot plane sticking up in the wind. Wind blows against it, it's a pretty strong pressure. So we've learned over years to not build <laughs> right on the windy bluff, unless we live in Anacortes, right? We try to not do that, and we put trees in our yards, and we put siding and weather barriers, all kinds of stuff to slow this one down. But it's a huge motivating factor. Next one. The next one is mechanical effects in the house. So this can be something as common sense as turning on a piece of exhaust equipment, right? Suck air out, well, new air should come in. If it didn't, you'd create a vacuum and you would either be like the person in space who drifts outside of the capsule and dies, or the house would collapse upon itself. And since I haven't seen either of those happen yet, I'm pretty sure every time we take air out of the house, new air finds its way in. These could be really strong forces. In our tight houses, this is a much bigger problem. The tighter we get, the smaller a fan it takes to create a big pressure difference. Um, we'll talk about a little bit about a little more about that in a few minutes. Um, next one. The one that is probably the least strong in its motive, but has the most opportunities, is what we call leakage by stack effect. So you've heard that heat rises. Right? Well, that's only one-third true. Only warm air rises. Heat through radiation and conduction is an equal opportunity exploiter. It'll go every direction. But warm air is more buoyant. 
right? And it will rise, and it will create something called stack effect in buildings. So that warm air will rise, try to escape out the top, while new air is going to be forced in. What do you suppose happens in Florida? The opposite. You cool the air in the house and it sinks and it leaks out the bottom and new air comes in from there. So their building science is kind of upside down and backwards there, but the same exact principles, just flowing in the reverse orders. So these are the major motivations in our house. Let's go to the next slide. I'm actually sometimes called in to help figure out precisely how strong these factors are going to be. Um, this is the kind of stuff that I get to do, right? It's lots of fun. This is trying to calculate what's the impact on a house from the stack effect and based on the tightness of the house, the mechanical effects put on that house. The only reason I show this is I'm going, I want us to reference this in a few minutes when I propose something to everyone, okay? Think about when I do this calculation here for an average tight house that's 500 feet above sea level, that's 1,900 square feet, that's uh, two stories tall, and it's located in Seattle, Washington, I get about a two Pascal delta. Yeah, uh, right? Dan, not to interrupt you, but isn't there a capital W in that equation that means all the windows are closed? Yes, this is, would be with the house in what we call winter operating conditions, which means doors and windows are closed. Um, but I'm gonna bring that back too. It is, and I'm gonna bring that back too. My point being, for an average semi-tight house, this might be responsible for a couple of pascals. In that same house being very tight though, that can be double or triple the amount. So I, want to, I just want you to consider that as I come up with something in just a minute. Next slide. Um, well, I was hoping to go through the animations, but that's okay. What does B-I-T-V-I-R mean? Tom? You know this. Build it tight, ventilate it right. We've been saying that for, I've been saying that. I've been running around telling everyone that for 20 years. That's how we need to do this. But what do we mean by tight? Right? The kind of the definition we're starting to use nowadays is about three air changes per hour, 50 or less. It's kind of cons what we consider tight. Why that number? Um, on one hand, it's because I, anecdotally speaking, that's what I see in houses that are put a lot of effort in it. You can also, however, look at code and say the 2015 IECC. That's the bottom end of tightness on the scale of what they recommend for homes. That's kind of our definition of tight. What do we mean by ventilate it right? Anyone? Balanced. Um, Sean brought up there's some changes coming to ASHRAE. One of the big changes is going to be to make a move towards balanced ventilation. Um, sounds like a great idea. It comes, though, at some costs. And that's what I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes. Um, beyond that, Ventilate it right can mean two different things for a house. It can mean total ventilation rate, right, making sure the house has enough total air exchange to really breathe, and it can be source ventilation. As we talked about earlier, remove the moisture, remove the pollutants at the places that they're created. So what is the tool that we use really often in the advanced and green community to help us get to a house that's ventilated right? What's this a picture of? An ERV or an HRV? Which, by the way, up here, I know ERVs are popular. I can't figure out why. If, unless your house is really large or you're in an extremely dry area, there's no sense in putting the moisture back in. Just go ahead and get rid of it. An HRV also costs a couple hundred dollars less to get the HRV model. It probably is going to suffice just as well. HRVs is what we've been putting a lot of our effort on. The prob here's the problem that we're starting to see, and here's the challenge that I want to present to folks. We've been saying build a tight ventilator right. We've been putting all this effort into controlling the house so that we're in control of the ventilation. We're talking about balanced systems with heat recovery, saving, making sure we have high efficacy fans in these that actually use the lowest amount of electricity possible to move that air. All of that stuff sounds really good and it really can work. The problem is, is it working? Let's look at the next slide. This is the challenge. Um, 40 homes in a pilot program I've been working on for the past two and a half years. Um, by the way, we're about to build 100 more in this pilot. So we're learning some things. These homes have a target of two air changes per hour at 50. Now, they actually have turned out anywhere from about 0.6, because a couple of them are near passive house, to about three. But all what I would consider in the tight range. 
they all have, 100% of these have either the Zender or the Life Breath, top of the line, highest efficiency HRVs on the marketplace, right? Um, and this, again, this is a pilot where we're looking at total performance of these homes. We're monitoring this, uh, these homes daily, these 40 homes. So we're using the SiteSage energy monitoring system. We can actually look at everything from the energy use from the HR HRV, the, the actual the power draw, to the total impact, to the air movement, to the temperature in the air, um, and the exhaust stream, and the incoming stream, temperature in the rooms, all of that stuff. So of the total units, what percent is capable of meeting the design airflow versus not capable of meeting the design airflow based on the way it was installed? Um, unfortunately, only 40% with the installation are actually capable of meeting the design airflow. This means when operating at the medium to lower ranges, the kind of thing that you would typically set a house on for background ventilation, they're not able to do it. That either the ductwork is not designed correctly, um, they used incorrect grills and distribution vents. Um, they didn't install the controls correctly. A full 40% of them not capable of, of will ever meet the design. What happens when we have a house that we built really tight and we can't ventilate it right? Right? Now, beyond that, let's talk about the ones that when we actually showed up, were they set to operate correctly? This is a pilot house. Pilot homes, right? We've been, we've been spending hundreds of hours over these 40 homes working with the HVAC contractors, the raters, the builders. How did they turn out as far as how they were set the day that we showed up to do final commission? Um, four of them were turned off entirely. I mean, the Sean, that's a great way to save energy. Um, but the one of them I was at Habitat for Humanity House in Tacoma uh, just two weeks ago. Uh, five bedrooms, seven residents two teenage boys, one teenage girl. How do you think that house smelled, considering this thing hadn't been on? Never mind the fact that they actually had a squeegee in the bathroom for the mirror, right? Because they, that was the only way to do it. It didn't smell very good. Um, the control for that was located in the closet with the idea people would be less likely to monkey with it and turn it off. It also meant nobody knew where it was to turn it on, right? We had another that were not set um, to run as commissioned or designed. The large chunk of them, only a small percent, were actually set with the right settings. How many of you know which manufacturers have a preference to run for 20 minutes on and 40 minutes off, and which one has a preference to run continuous? Does anybody here know that difference between these? We're the experts. We better know this stuff, right? <laughs> we're going to train humans how to do this. Wouldn't it be great if we all know these answers? You had a question here before I get too far down the road? Oh, I, I was wondering if, if you noticed uh, a lot of the um, intake and exhaust units were not set So, yeah, the question is, are they not set appropriately? The, uh, the little, uh, the termini, as we'll call them, right? So the intake and the exhaust. Yeah, that's a common problem. The bigger problem, however, is that half of these um, systems have damper controls and measure pressuring ports on the HRV itself and that's the best way to do the balancing and that's the best way to check it yet none of the HVAC contractors know how to do that um, the other half of them don't come with that and your only choice is to try to do it at the register so you've got different pieces of technology trying to achieve the same job some which are designed to run part-time on part-time off others designed to run continuously and yet our builders don't know how to install them correctly. Our HVAC contractors don't know how to duct them correctly, set the controls. The homeowners have no idea how these work. And these are in our advanced performance homes where we're spending hundreds of hours working with these people. My point on this, if we're telling people to build it tight and ventilate it right, did we put the cart before the horse, right? I'm not suggesting that this won't work. I'm suggesting it currently is not working in these homes that we're looking at. There are some solutions. Um, homeowner operation manuals are a pretty good deal. You know, leaving post-it notes for your wife is a pretty good deal. But what happens when Lucas and his wife move out in eight years? Because the average length of occupancy in a home is seven years. What are the odds the new homeowner finds the post-it note that Lucas left for his wife? Not very good if there's not an operating manual. 
the operating manual is only written on paper, it's shoved in a drawer, what's the odds that that makes it past time of sale? So we really, really need to think of these. Remember the equations and the graph that I showed earlier about calculating stack effect and doing that kind of stuff? In these types of homes, those pressures are much greater with a tall house in winter operating conditions um, that's really, really tight in an HRV that I can't work or isn't set to work. Those kind of pressures can be really, really high and causing all kinds of unanticipated problems in the home. So my proposal is, as we're working towards this, the lion's share of homes, if we actually want them to perform today, we need to think about what is a reasonable tightness to put in the house. And more so than what's the number, where did we do our air sealing? Should our house be connected to our garage? Now, that's probably not a good idea. How about to the crawl spaces with the sleeping bear? <laughs> probably not a good idea. How about to the attic where those moisture problems we saw in the attic, it's because warm moist air got in there and condensed on the underside of the roof. Is that a great plan? So maybe we need to change our way of thinking for the time being to say, let's not worry about what that number is per se. Maybe a house around three and a half air changes per hour is pretty good. But let's focus on sealing the planes from the places that cause our problems. A little bit of air that filters through a wall, under a door, around a window, heck, the building is working slowly as an HRV and a filter. Right? That's, we've had, we have worse problems than that. So maybe we want to start thinking there. And then I'm going to bring us back to another idea in a little bit. The other thing to this concept is, should our assemblies themselves breathe, right? Shouldn't my wall be able to breathe? Well, <laughs> that's a tricky question. Um, let's go to the next slide. Who knows the difference between this and this? Good, because we should know, because we're the people that should know. How about this and this, right? Good. Do you know which of those should be touching each other or should be in the same place? I mean, most of the time the answer is yes in most scenarios. This becomes a critical piece of the puzzle. Understanding what these things mean. Do you think that everyone knows what a vapor barrier or a vapor retarder or semi-impermeable versus impermeable versus permeable means? Um, actually, if you look online, the DOE and Wikipedia have one definition. Um, Building Science Corporation um, and the IACC have a different definition of what a vapor barrier actually means. Where does it start being impermeable? Is it below one perm or is it below 0.1 perm? The true answer is below 0.1 perm is truly impermeable, and between 0.1 and 1 is semi-impermeable. My point being, when we talk about should walls breathe, my thing is, again, let's understand what our problems are and solve the ones we can deal with first. Vapor barrier and air barrier should always, in almost all cases, be as closely aligned as humanly possible. And then, if you really want it to work, they should be always touching the insulation barrier. The weather barrier is the one piece that may be able to be fluctuated and be in a different place from the rest of them depending on your wall design. One more. As Joe Stiebrick would say, um, lots of, and I don't like Joe Stiebrick necessarily as a person, but I love the way his brain works. As a person, he's kind of an a-hole. But as a building scientist, he's a flippin' genius, right? He's looked at more buildings and gone through more problem solving he, his favorite thing is he tried to semi-retire to Aspen, and all he did was have a whole bunch of new friend, ski bum friends who asked him for advice in a really cold climate. That's what, that's what actually all of his time in Aspen has spent doing. But his idea here is let's understand where our control layers are. Let's make sure the ones that are supposed to touch are touching. And then for the love of God, let's protect them, right? Let's make sure they're not exposed to UV rays or really um, standing snow or solar driven moisture issues. Let's protect our barriers and our control layers from the environment and then let's protect our structure from these cold, wet, or hot places. So let's take a look at this. So what does that mean for a breathable wall? Well, there's two ways we can think about it. We can think about wetting potential versus drying potential. When we say 
My wall needs to be breathable. It's because we fear that bad things may happen to it, right? It may, the building structure may change and may swell due to temperatures and due to moisture. We might have the dreaded SVG. I don't say the M word anymore because I've worked too often with insurance companies, so suspected visible growth is my term I use <laughs> instead. Yeah. That's what. And I think was using it to It is an important distinction to make, and that's what I'm trying to get to with the walls here. Is when we say a breathable wall, what do we really mean? Do we mean it lets air through it, or do we mean it's vapor permeable? And I would say it really comes down to understanding this concept of wetting potential and drying potential is our best bet for it. Let's take a look at this next slide here. This is what I mean with that. Let's, if you look at what's called the perfect wall. Um, again, this is Joe Stebrick was the, he stole this idea actually from other people, but he's the one who kind of coined the term, the perfect residential wall. The idea isn't that vapor can go all the way through the wall. It's that it always has a drying potential to another direction. So in this scenario, he has his vapor barrier or his vapor control layer and his air control layer and his weather control layer in between two different pieces of insulation. Rigid insulation in this case on the outside, but it could also be a Larson truss or something else. And then a standard insulated cavity on the inside. This design works everywhere in America. In a really, really cold environment, you need to have a little bit more insulation out here. But other than that, this will work in every area. So back to the question that you posed, George. Is this a breathable wall? Well, to me, it actually does the job that we would expect the concept of breathable and vapor terms to mean. If it gets wet from either direction, it has a chance to dry back out. But it isn't truly breathable in the sense that air or vapor can make it all the way through. We're also seeing a movement with double walls. Um, I'm with uh, Allison Bales and a couple other building scientists love this idea, but it's almost a little too similar to the HRV to me right now. It's hard to pull it off right. Two insulated cavities and a double wall with your air control barrier right down the middle. The problem with it that we're seeing is people aren't getting that wall right, that center wall. I know John's done this and some others, and it can be done right. But just like anything else, it's a little new that we don't have a lot of experience with. We have to understand we're kind of playing trial and error. This is gonna behave in a double wall, like this does in a single wall. Yes? So in the northwest, is there any need for a vapor barrier? That's my next one we're going to get to. The question was, so we, do we really need a vapor barrier? Well, what we need is a vapor control strategy. What level of barrier we actually achieve? No. The answer is we, let's go to the next one. We actually need, sorry, this is a really hard one to read unless you're standing right here, so I'll read it for you. This, what this is saying is in the marine climate, which is Seattle and Portland basically, oh, that is really hard to read. If you understand what your sheathing is, right, which is, there we go, look at that. If our sheathing is over one perm, right, does anybody know what OSB is in terms of perms? By itself about two, right? So if we have sheathing and we don't have Prosoco or some sort of vapor barrier painted on it, on our exterior, then our interior should be a class three, right? That means this house is gonna dry better towards the inside if we have a class two on the outside. What if we have a class three on the outside, right? What if it's skip sheathing, something of that nature? If we have, or this was, sorry, this is, if we have a super tight one, then we need to have um, the vapor, th the profile three, a non-vapor barrier paint, and we should do dew point calculations to determine if that wall could ever achieve dew point within it, putting it in what uh, would be called a CSI or condensing surface of interest. In this case, I'm not talking about top shows, I'm talking about condensing surface of interest. If we have a semi-tight wall, then we can either do the class three paint with the calculations, or we can do a class two on our insulation insulation with craft paper, or you guys know what an SVR is? got to love all these crazy analogies nowadays. A smart vapor retarder. <laughs> Based on humidity and temperature, it changes 
how tight it really works in that sense. Kind of a cool new thing, new experimental thing. So we'll make all this available to everyone so you don't have to try to memorize this or take too many pictures of it. But the idea is that make sure you don't put an extremely tight barrier on both sides. Make sure you always have at least one direction to dry in. In the Northwest, if we're spending the time keeping our air clean and dry on the inside, the ability to dry back to the inside is a pretty good bet, and that's what most of these designs are based on. Okay. So that was the section on walls. The last one, I don't have a lot here, but I just want to talk about this idea, the difference between truly breathing fresh air and having the sense and the feeling of it. Let's go to the next slide. Sometimes it does really come down to the space that we're in. Having space that's wide open, it can be very rustic looking, it can be very modern looking, but having open spaces has a mental change on people. When you walk into that space, it feels more open. It feels like, I can really breathe, regardless of how tight that space is. By and large, we're seeing a trend in new construction back to common spaces and master bedrooms, having vaulted ceilings, having sweeping heights. We made that change just several years ago to go from eight foot ceilings to 10 foot ceilings in a lot of our new construction. And all of it was to give a sense without adding additional square feet of having more space. And all of that is part of this mental connection to feeling like we can breathe in our homes. That was one too many. Um, it also sometimes comes down to light. And I'm not going to bore you with the action spectrum for melatonin regulation in humans evidence for a novel circadian photoreceptor, except for the fact that there's a study that actually talks about how our circadian rhythms change the more we're exposed to daylight in our buildings. Right? So getting us back to the natural rhythms that our body want to live on are highly dependent on our exposure to light. I know this because I live in a basement level of a house. Right? That's what happens when I live at home, but I travel a lot. And I find that, weirdly enough, I sleep better now on the road. I shouldn't say sleep better. When I wake up, it's, it's easier to wake up when I'm on the road than it is when I'm at home. Because my Seattle house has a nice east-facing window, really big, in my bedroom. My Portland house has a nice south-facing window, really big, in my bedroom. Um, I can actually wake up. I feel refreshed every time I do it. And there's actually some science behind that. And if we're clever, we can do two things with once with this idea of adding more lighting. We can go back to one of the things we started with at the beginning with Sean, that's been brought up a couple of times. We can also use the idea of having a lot of natural light to combine that with operable windows and have that be a part of our strategy. Now, the question I asked myself when I was doing this is, if I think people can't figure out how to run an HRV, what makes me so sure they can figure out how to open windows, um, right? It's a real potential issue, but I think it's a little bit easier to understand the post-it note that says, on a warm day, open the window, than it is to say, on a warm day, change the setting on the HRV from two to four, and then make sure you hit the boost button when you're cooking. Um, but on a cold day, you can turn it all the way down to one. No, that's probably going to be hard. And then don't forget every three months to clean the filter on your heat recovery ventilator, um, change the bag in your whole house vacuum, right? We start to get these things that's like, oh man, this is a lot of work to live in these tight homes. So maybe, just maybe, we can combine this idea of the feeling of space, the feeling of light, and tie it back in with the original idea around ventilation. Let's make sure that that house that's semi-tight with a decent ventilation strategy includes operable windows. As we work our way towards the day when really tight homes with HRVs are common, at least that we HVAC contractors understand how to size them and install them and builders understand how to communicate with homeowners and homeowners understand how to run them. That is the goal but we need to take steps to get there along the way that makes sense and that are also being conscious of the energy that it takes to run these homes. Um, so some resources. This is my one plug because this means I get paid for being here tonight. Um, so one of the programs I work on, we actually work on in creating tools 
for people um, to help them make the right decisions. One of the ones we have is on thermal enclosures, how to make good decisions on your wall choices, the materials you use, how you build your walls. It's a tear resistant, construction proof paper poster. You can uh, either download it yourself or if you have an energy rater, your energy rater can always order them from us. We have another one on HRV best practices, um, which is all about how to choose the type of unit you want, um, determine the size it should be, determine how to com uh, install it and how to commission it so that it will work correctly because we found that right. We also have another one on ducted mini splits versus ductless mini splits and how to make the right choices depending on the type of home that you have. So we've got a lot of this kind of cool stuff that we can share. Um, when we send this out later, the web links to download those directly are here, or you can also contact me or an energy rater that you know um, who will be able to order these for you. Next slide. Um, this is the last one. These are all the places where I stole all the information that I put in my presentation tonight. But in general, this is just a lot of the really good resources that are put, for the most part, in an easy to understand way. Um, so if you work your way through, and I tried to put them in, it in the order that makes a little bit of sense based on what I was talking about as well. Um, but there's a lot of really good resources here available. So that's what I have as far as planned presentation. Any additional questions? Yes? So the question was, nobody has talked about rain screens. Let's go back a few slides to the perfect wall if we can find it. Um, the perfect wall does include a rain screen, wouldn't you know it? This is right here. Uh, well, this particular version of the picture, it's brick, but the non-brick one, it does include a rain screen. Again, the ability to dry back out, actually that is a rain screen. The ability to dry out this way is what the rain screen is there for. Um, behind the rain screen, there's also another simple one. This will be an easy one for you to remember, which is don't tuck your raincoat into your underwear. <laughs> which is a way to think about how you apply your weather barriers, right? Never tuck one thing down into something else. Um, but putting a rain screen or a wind screen on top of that is an excellent thing. Chris? What goes along with that is how fast can it dry itself out? It only takes 48 hours. So the question is how fast can it dry itself out? You know, another great question. It's true that under the right conditions, mold can grow in as little as 48 hours. What's interesting in the Northwest, thankfully for us, is that the really wet time is different than the really warm time. And it's when you have the really wet and the really warm at the same time that you get really big problems, right? So these types of designs work really well because they allow, when it's wet, plenty of time to dry before it gets hot. Um, they've done some studies with, um, recently on, will double walls have problems, right? Will they have condensation problems in them? And the answer was, eh, maybe. Uh, it depends on what you do. The one that had cellulose in it had no instance of mold growth, but they think that might have been due to the borate and cellulose more than anything else because the nails were definitely rusty after three years um, on the inside. So these things all need to be put into consideration. That's why we actually like the other double wall with the guy down the middle. That's an even better bet. Um, in our climate, you can do double walls all day. It's probably not a problem, but if you get to eastern Washington or Idaho or Montana or Alaska, you want to be careful with double walls, uh, unless you put that air barrier down the middle. All right, if it's nothing else, I'll let Walter wrap it up and then we'll ask all of you to help us put chairs back, which is a fun thing if you have, don't come to many of these, is that's how you'll get your steps, um, is helping us put all the chairs back. So thank you guys very much. Um, we'll give it back to Walter to wrap it up. Thank you again for attending the Northwest Eco Building Guild Wednesday night um, educational event.